Hey, good evening, everybody. If we can just get started. Um, I'd just like to thank you all for coming out tonight. In case you don't know who I am, but I think I know most everybody here. I'm Kevin Kerr. I'm the principal here at this uh, fine school, South Middle School. And I just wanted to thank you once again for coming. But more importantly, just to introduce why we invited you to come tonight. It's an opportunity for you to sit and talk with our new superintendent, Kathy Smith. And just she wants your input and your feedback how we can make this great school system even better. And we can't do it without your help. So I'm going to turn things over to Kathy. All right, welcome to South. Thank you very All right, much. and here are our parents. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you very much for coming out. Uh, I have had the opportunity the past month to uh, do what we call a listening tour. And this is part of uh, my transitional plan. As a new superintendent, uh, not new to the district, I've been in Brockton for 37 years, but as your new superintendent, it is incumbent upon me to get out into the district, meet with the parents, meet with the community, and have conversations with you about what is good about the Brockton Public Schools. What is important for us to keep? What are things you would like to see change? What are some of your concerns as we move forward? All of this is part of an even bigger plan. As we speak, I have a group called a transition team that is meeting all over the city with what I call external and internal stakeholders. External stakeholders are college presidents, people from businesses, you know, Harbor One, a number of the businesses in our community, community agencies that are coming together and they're supporting four what we call subcommittees. There's a subcommittee for operations, a subcommittee for finance, there's a subcommittee for teaching and learning, a subcommittee on culture and context in the district. I'm actually going to Brockton High School tomorrow to hear a student voice. I'm going to be meeting with the people that are your athletic directors, your coaches. So I'm trying to get as many voices as I can to hear, again, about our Brockton public school system and how we are, my favorite line has been, how we're resourced for success going into the future. And I'm hopefully talking in the next three to five years, what do we need to continue to make our school district competitive, make sure our children are able to go on to successful college and careers. So, so that is the goal. Uh, so uh, the format has been, uh, again, if you have questions for me, if there are things that you would like to share with me, all of this information is being taken down, and again, it will be part of an entry plan for a new superintendent. Those of you that don't know me, you did hear me mention I've been in the district 37 years. I started here in 1977 as a Title I math coach. I have been a special education teacher. I have been a school adjustment counselor. I've been what they call a CS squared entrepreneur, which is a grant writer working with business to school connections. I've been the MCAS manager when M MCAS first came in to support our children with academic support opportunities. And I have been, uh, most recently, your director of community schools, which again is providing opportunities not only for children, but also adults in our community, alternative education programs. So I, I've had a, a broad a spectrum of jobs in the district and have really enjoyed, when I tell you, um, it, I don't think you ever can predict what it's like for, for any of you that you take on a new job. I always say it takes a good year before you really feel comfortable. Well, I have to tell you, I feel very comfortable as your superintendent, but there are a lot of initiatives out there. There's a lot of work ahead. Uh, it's a lot of hours, and I appreciate your time tonight to share with me your thoughts about the district. So who would like to go first? Yes, uh, the school committee meeting last night, uh, one of the issues was class size, and we wanted to know um, what would be the initiative to lower the class sizes because we, it, it seemed that they were too high, and we wanted what you think would be uh, an appropriate level for a student to teach ratio. show. Well, it depends on the level. Uh, and when you look at our youngest students that are coming into our district, many of them are English language learners. If you ask me what, what a, a good class size would be for our younger students, I would stand here and tell you probably 15 students in a class maximum. Now, the reality of that is a couple of things. One is there are budget issues. You know, we do have to live within a budget. And also, we have facility issues. Many of you saw that this year, it's been very hard to predict in this community the growth rate. 
Many times when you do a demographic study, you're looking at census, you're looking at the birth rate in the hospitals, you're looking at the realtors and homes that they're selling. What's happened in Brockton, it's been very difficult to predict. We've had a number of new students coming from other countries, and it's been difficult for us to keep up with understanding those numbers. Last year, we had an additional 490 students that came into the district. This year, we're approaching 500 additional students on top of last year, 490. That is a huge growth rate. So you're looking at 1,000 students in two years. What that did to us, I mean, that's, that's bigger than some of our biggest schools. What you saw happen this year is we, uh, in April of last year, made a decision that we would reopen the Barrett Russell School, the B.D. Russell School. It has become a kindergarten center. And I will have to tell you, if you get an opportunity to go over and see it, it's a building that we've renovated. Our craftsmen have come in. It's a beautiful building. We have 300 little kindergartners sitting there. So you ask about a plan going forward. I need seats for those kindergartners going into first grade. So we have to take a look at, when I talk about a facility master plan, I'm actually going out to visit another district, and they have a 20-year facility master plan. And it isn't just about building new schools. It's also about renovating schools. It's about choosing locations. It's about you know taking a look at your district and making sure that you're planning for the future and not April to open up a building in September. So we need to do a better job of and this is going to be bringing everybody together. It's going to be the taxpayers. It's going to be the city councilors. It's going to be your school committee. And we're going to ask all of you to get involved when we get to that point. What do we want in our city? Today we actually celebrated with Treasurer Steve Grossman from the Mass Building Assistance Fund. And Steve came into the district because they're celebrating over $10 billion that they've given to money throughout the state for communities to renovate to build new schools, to repair roofs and boilers, uh, windows. You know, many of these projects we've had in Brockton the past couple of years. So we welcome that kind of assistance to help communities like Brockton or all communities in the Commonwealth. So again, this, this is a large plan. I will be asking for, and when I say that, it's not just school people involved in this. The community will be involved in a 20-year facility master plan. You'll be sitting on these committees deciding, do you want a K to A configuration? You know, do you want to keep our middle schools six to eight? You know, do we want to, you know, put together uh, plans where we have kindergarten centers? Do we want the kindergartens back in your so-called neighborhood schools? So there's a lot of discussion. Back a few years ago, when we had very tight budget cuts, I don't know if you remember at the time, there was talk about the Raymond School coming offline. And the talk was within a couple of months of actually taking the Raymond School offline. We had to put a new roof on. We had to do a lot of renovations. People were up in arms, and of course they were. You didn't give people a chance to have input. You didn't give the community a chance to voice their concerns. If you have a 20-year facility master plan, you'll know five years ahead of time that we're taking a particular building offline, why we are, and when we expect it to come back online. So again, this will be something that we involve the community as we start to take a look at class size. And I tell you to go and look at, Boston Magazine last month has an issue, and it talks about your high-performing school districts in the state. And when you look at, and of course I'll tell you right now, it's the Wellesleys, you know, it's the Westons, and they have 15 students in their, in their primary classes. Well, again, when you talk about the numbers coming down, they are coming down. What happens, though, is you start out with a budget, and you take a look and you cap first grade at, let's say, 22, 23, and you start school. Most districts are stable at that point. You know, that, that's a good place to start. What happens to us during the year, we have numbers of children that came in. It's very hard to predict are they coming into the first grades. So we start to balance that with our parent information center, that helps parents choose schools in their so-called zones. But at times, it presents a problem. Right now, the Davis School. Parents want to choose. That's their neighborhood school. And we have some class sizes there that are 27, 28 in a class. And that, that again, is difficult. Even if I were to put a new teacher in, there isn't another spot, meaning facility-wise, in that school to decrease you know, those, those number of children in the schools. So I think you'll see, when we start to talk about a strategic plan, 
you'll certainly see a plan in place to be taking a look at the numbers of students in the classes. And that'll be part of budget, facility master plan, uh, talking about capacity, uh, and certainly being able to predict where we're going next year with the students we presently have. Um, I have a few concerns. Um, I can just do one at a time, or I can list them for you. Um, okay. um, I have two students, a uh, fourth grader and an eighth grader, in the TAG program. And I'm very concerned about the fact that they are not going to have the option to take Spanish with their Chinese. I, uh, um, I, I think the Chinese is a great idea, and I'm not advocating to end it, but I do think that they should um, allow the kids to have the option to take Spanish along with that at some point. I just don't like the idea of my children graduating from high school, never, ever, ever having taken Spanish. Um, in school. Okay, can I clarify that? Are you saying that, so we're talking about your eighth grade child? Um, yes. Okay, and your eighth grade child right now is, I'm going to guess, at the Plouffe School. Right. The Plouffe Academy, and is taking Chinese, and that is the only option at that point. Um, he can, we can um, choose for him to not take Chinese and take Spanish, but yeah, at this point he's taken um, Chinese, and even when he is tracked to the high school, he will not have the option of taking Spanish in addition to the Chinese. One of the things that we actually discussed uh, the other night, we had a curriculum subcommittee meeting, uh, I want to say it was last Tuesday night, and we brought up the difficulties. We had parents that came, and they were concerned, again, about something very similar, where their children went up to Brockton High, and Brockton High has a modified block schedule, and when kids go up there, there are certain subjects that they have to take, especially in their freshman and sophomore year. And what it did to those children, we only have two Chinese teachers up there. Language was an area where we had budget cuts a number of years ago. The language teachers were cut in the budget. And not only that, as I said, I've only got two Chinese teachers, and I believe we have close to 300 youngsters that have left, let's say, the Cliff Academy, or I believe the Davis School also has Chinese, and we're unable to accommodate them. So a couple of things. As we start to work with, again, this is something that is bargained with our teacher unit. So it's something that involves bargaining. Uh, it involves sitting down with our high school leadership team, as we have already begun to do. You're not the only one. There's been parents concerned when they go up to the high school, not only the language classes, they want their children to take band. This is you know, important for kids going on to college to not only have the academic skills, but to be well-rounded in all of these areas. So this is a concern of ours, and we're dealing with it up at the high school. I also will have to deal with it in Barbie. Uh, just, to, just quickly, I don't want to hog all the time, but um, I also had uh, the grading system, I'm sure, is a huge thing. So I just wanted to mention that I do have some con concerns about the incentive part of, I think it's sort of like a great technique to teach kids and teach them what they should know in the classroom and keep it, you know, basic and keep it to where you don't really have to test them. But then there's a concern about not only the children's incentive to do what they should do, but also some way of communicating to the parents. Um, I can see on, my, on, on the report card what's going on, one, two, three, four, whatever, but during the school year on a weekly basis, it would be nice if I saw a test, a quiz, something with a grade so that I knew what was going on with my kids. So obviously this is an issue. So you're not getting feedback on what's happening with their day-to-day -day grading. Is that what you're saying to me? Right. So, you know, a, a passive site feedback. I don't want my eighth grade teacher to have to call me or text me or email me how's my kid doing. But it sort of ends up being that way if I go through his backpack one day and I see a, a, a grade that, and then it's like, oh my God, I didn't know this was happening. And now my only option is to call the teacher and say, listen, can you just, yeah, do, do, you know, because my fourth grader, she gets her spelling test, she gets her math test, she gets her little, you know, so I can see what's going on in the little steps. And so the grading system, and I, I think they will be shocked when they get to high school and they're used to this lackadaisical, oh, we just do what we're supposed to do and we don't degrade. When they get to high school and they start getting graded, 
and they have to worry about. I think you're I talking think, about standards-based report card versus. Yes. Okay. All right. So, yes. so that's one issue, and I know some of our middle schools have standard-based report cards. Right. The other thing that we're trying to do for parents is uh, we have something called Infinite Campus. It is our student management system. And if you go to our neighbors next door in Whitman Hanson, they also have Infinite Campus. And there's something called the Parent Portal on there. So that is something that we're starting to look at to make sure that we can communicate with you, you know, with our staff, so you can see exactly what your students are doing. You can have information about the children in a timely manner yes. as to what is happening, and you can communicate. So that is something that, that we have to do as a district. In this day and age, when you come from an urban center, Many times you hear, well, not everybody has access to computers. But how many, how many of you do in the audience? How many have access to tablets? You know, right, so, so many of you do. I mean, you have iPhones, you have, you have ways that you want to communicate with computers. If not, we'll have to take a look at the district also to make sure that the libraries are staffed sufficiently if we're able to communicate with parents in this way. And just one more thing. Sure. Um, this is just a... a um, a suggestion or a comment. I think our students would be a lot more competitive if um, if we had some more current events, some more geography. I can sort of understand, I'm a science-based person, but I still understand that they're not getting as much science because you can get science at some point and catch up, but not having um, a, you know any idea of what's going on in the world for our high school, for middle school kids, to not have any geography and and I think that's an easy thing to to you know to add to the curriculum just some geography and current events which actually kind of goes together I don't see any of that at all anything other than like math and and um, ELA well I mean there's more going on than math and ELA but I would hope but, in but, a well-rounded curriculum yeah, that the teacher is talking about we don't see much science and we don't see much geography or current events and just, that's just just a little tidbit that you don't have to respond to that. Just know that there's a parent out okay. there concerned about Thank it. you very much. Very, very helpful. What initiatives or outreach is being done to increase the diversity among the staff? I've talked about this uh, in many places. It, 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 again, when you've been in the district a long time, um, it, this is something that I'm not just saying to you. You know, having been the director of community schools and worked in a number of programs, a number of years ago, we had initiatives when all these grants were coming in. And we started future teacher clubs at the middle schools that were called junior highs at the time. And those students became part of a summer program where we involved junior high kids. We involved high school students that were part of the future teachers club so that those students were actually teaching assistants in the summer. They were developing projects for us. And we had probably close to, I want to say 2,000 youngsters, bigger than many school systems that surround us in summer programs. The goal was that those students would go on to college, they would become our college teaching assistants, and they would come back to teach in Brockton. And many times they did. So, so here's my answer now in 2013. When you talk about diversity, if you look at our Brockton High School, you have over 70% minority students. And those 70% minority students are in advanced placement classes. You know, they're in the IB program. You know, they're excellent learners. These are the kinds of people that you want to be teaching in our district. You don't have to convince them to come here. They're comfortable with urban education. These are their friends. These are their neighbors. My feeling is we need to support the grow your own model. And again, I just talked about it with my transition team tonight. We're talking about some of the feedback that they're getting. We need to bring these initiatives to the forefront. And when I talk about collaborations with businesses and community partners, I'm talking about them helping to support our funding for future teacher clubs, so not only can I have teacher leaders working with students, but we can have, again, if I have middle school or high school students, they can be bused to some of the elementary schools. They can actually be reading buddies. They can help with tutoring programs. By the time you get to high school, my goal is then that you actually take a look at those students that are excellent in the area of science, math, Special, working with special needs students. Those are our high need areas. By supporting them at a high school, collaborating with the colleges, a Stonehill, a Bridgewater State University. Maybe we discuss a loan forgiveness program where the college you know, has part of this and the Brockton Public Schools works that if these students come back and teach in our district, 
They give us five years of, of their teaching. You start to do a loan forgiveness. And by that, to me, it doesn't matter who those students are from Brockton High, whether they're minority or non-minority, because by virtue of 70%, you're going to start to diversify your staff with the people that will stay here and commit to our city. And that involves, again, everybody in the community. It isn't just the school system doing that. It's really partnering. So when you talk about the initiatives going on around the country, it, it isn't just in Massachusetts, but Massachusetts adopted, when it took race to the top money, you know, we adopted uh, going forward the Common Core field testing of what they call PARC, which is your new assessment system coming in. And the idea was that if a student leaves Massachusetts, if they go to Rhode Island, if they go to Connecticut, we're all teaching the same things. And this, again, this did come from, it came from business. It came from people working in the colleges, you know, talking about the kind of preparations that we were doing with our students. So as far as the Common Core and, and changing over from what was our mass curriculum frameworks, we've been actually doing that for a number of years. So your students, you know, your teachers have been working on developing curriculum together, working with other groups around the state to bring us to the point that all of our subject areas are changing into the Common Core, which will be tested on the PARC exam. Now, as far as the PARC versus MCAS, we have a very rigorous test in MCAS. Our students are some of the best prepared. We're not worried like other parts of the country with this particular <coughs> testing. But we are going to be field testing this spring, this PARC initiative. And a lot of it is students taking the test online. And that is something that our students have not really been prepared for. Students all over have not been prepared for the online testing. So we're now getting ready to start to work with our youngest students so they're comfortable taking a test online. There are things that they'll be able to test online that they wouldn't be able to test with paper and pencil. So the jury is out on this. I know there's been a lot of controversy. I've seen some of you at the school committee meetings. And it's good that you're discussing this. This is good for all of us to have a very healthy discussion about what is coming down. Now, as your new superintendent, I am sitting with urban, urban superintendents from all over the state that are questioning some of these changes. We're, we're feeling very good as a district about bringing in the Common Core, about supporting math and the sciences and English language arts, writing across the curriculum. So I can stand here and tell you I am very confident with that. As far as what's happening with your MCAS test and with the PARC test coming in, the jury is out on that. I'm happy to continue to report back to you on that. And as far as the scores, you know, where they are right now, there are some schools that have, have made wonderful gains. Um, last night, I actually uh, had a presentation before the school committee on what I called a snapshot. And all, all it is is really talking about us and how we can compare uh, to the state, how our district is doing, how we compare to other urban districts, um, we do have concerns in some areas, and what I'll be prepared to do probably sometime in early December. We're going to be going through um, a district review right now, which comes from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. So until I can get the district through, every five years it goes through this district review. How lucky I am in my first year as superintendent that this has come down already. So what I'm looking to do is come December, we will have conversations uh, with the community about what our plans are for those scores that are flat. What are the plans that we have for some of the schools that I'm going to be calling superintendent focus schools that we need to put extra resources and we need to take a look at why our students aren't progressing the way that they need to. So that's something that I'll be prepared to certainly talk to the district about in, in December. My, my kids are in the TAG program, and they start them on a track with Chinese. So my understanding is after they get to high school, they continue on that track. If I really push, I can ditch the Chinese and do Spanish, but I can't do both. So my question was, at the high school level, do they not get to change their language? It's, it's not they don't get to change. No. Part of that reason is we are not staffed, we, we need to be staffed for language teachers. And that is a conversation that we're having. I was not no sooner sitting in as the superintendent that your department head of language, Jane Rizzitano, who is excellent, you know, very much out there wanting programs for your kids and talking to me about the numbers of students and in order for them to get accepted into prestigious colleges, I have to make sure that they have a number of years of language. One of the other issues that came up, when we cut languages back 
in 2009 when we had a very difficult budget, Portuguese and French were cut. And parents were really concerned. We have a lot of families, Haitian communities speech, speaking French Creole, uh, Portuguese families, your Cape Verdean community. And although they certainly, you know, their children are learning English, you know, as far as the heritage goes, are communicating in their own families. They were upset that those were languages that were cut. And again, that was done, you know, by budgetary decisions. So it is something we're aware of. Uh, again, you have a good advocate in our department head for, for languages. I, I even tried to um, speak with the Spanish teachers about doing something like a summer school, you know, like something like that um, as, a, as, as a suggestion. That could be a short-term uh, answer right. to yeah. some of this. You know, I'm right. hoping that we can address it you know, as the students go into high school. And like I told you, the schedule is not helping me up at the high school. And that's a concern. I don't know if I have high school parents in here. You know what, I'll, I will have to get back to you on that. I just want you to know that that is on a front burner. It is a discussion that we're having. We're definitely short staff. Uh, I, as I told you, when you even look at the children that are taking Chinese, coming from the Davis, coming from the Plouffe Academy, we're not staffed at the high school for them all to continue in Chinese up at the high school. I have two Chinese language teachers up there. I think right now they're teaching 192 students. I'm told the class size is a 35 to 38 students in a class. And even then, we can't service all of those students. So it is a concern. So I have two other concerns based around the same calendar. One is the Jewish holiday, and I mean no disrespect at all to anyone's religion, but the two days for the Jewish holidays, I don't see that the population brought in justifies us having two days. And I think in a situation where, you know, if someone needs to observe the two days, it wouldn't be held against them, so I definitely would like that to be looked at with the teacher contract. And as well, something else, um, possibly starting the school year in August, that week before Labor Day, get maybe two days in there. Um, you know, snow days come about and then we're in school just, so what, July 3rd, June 30th, the very end of the year. Um, Adrian, you bring, bring up really good points and, and let's, let's go to, you know, last year's calendar. Some years the way that the Jewish holidays fall, and I will say this, and I know there's no disrespect intended. When you've been around 37 years, you know the history. So many years ago, we had a large Jewish community, and what happened was, it wasn't about the children being absent from school to be able to, you know, celebrate their holidays. What it was was, we had a number of Jewish teachers and couldn't get substitute teachers. And it became very unsafe when you can't get substitutes for classrooms and you have, you know, children in those classrooms. So that became the issue back then. And I think it happened right when I came on, around 1977. The community has obviously changed. One thing that hasn't changed, and you brought up two points, when you look at last year, we had three Jewish holidays. I believe it was two for Rosh Hashanah, one for Yom Kippur, which doesn't always happen. Sometimes they'll fall on a weekend. We also had Hurricane Sandy, if you remember that, in October. You had two days off, and that was, of course, about electricity, you know, trees on the streets, etc. We then went into a bad winter. And not to bring up things again, but we had a difficult time with that big two storms, end of January, February, where we couldn't get the sidewalks cleared. And you remember how high the snow banks were, it was very difficult for the children to go to school. So you're absolutely correct when you talk about what happened. We went till June 28th, we lost Good Friday, that became, I believe, a half a day. And there are, again, you know, our Christian families, you know, on Good Friday, you know, want to attend services. So when you talk about all of those things, we are very aware of that, and you also brought up a point, it is part of bargaining with our teachers union, because that is part of their contract right now, that they will not start school before Labor Day. That doesn't mean that that's not something that we have discussion about. And I will tell you, the president of the Brockton Education Association, Kim Gibson, and I have talked about it. If you know about bargaining, many times it can be what they call an adversarial process. You know, people come in with proposals, you know, you kind of are both out here and you hope at some point to, to meet in the middle and come up with something that's agreeable to both sides. One of the things that we'd like to do this year is do what's called interest-based bargaining, which takes training on both sides, both your teacher union, labor side, and your management side, where you actually sit at the table together and you try to come with, you know, some conclusions. You try to come up with evidence and you try to talk about ways that will, again, better the district not only our teachers, our children, our families. So before I left the office today, Kim Gibson and I have talked about getting training 
getting ready. This is a bargaining year coming up. So I can assure you that that is something that we're, we're already talking about. And just one last comment. From a parental perspective, this year's opening was definitely, I'm not even sure what the word is, but to send this kids to school for one day and then have Thursday, Wednesday, well, Thursday Friday off. afternoon, that was really ridiculous. <laughs> beyond ridiculous. <laughs> but, I mean, the anxiety as well for kids, you know, going to new schools, the younger kids, the, I know, what, first grade, kindergarten, and sorry, yeah, but my daughter was going to a new school. It's just, that was really, really kind of, and I know it wasn't your planning. No, um, I... But to do that, to send it to the kids to school one day in a week, I think most people would do that. And you know what, Adrian? what we were trying to do, and, and it, 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 it looked foolish, and you had the Jewish holidays, we, we were stuck. We couldn't stop before Labor Day, which was Monday. The teachers came back on Tuesday. That's their first day back. We had the children come in on Wednesday. The next two days were the Jewish holidays. And we weren't willing to give up that one day by virtue of what happened last year with June 28th. You know, we were panicked that, you know, we, we, we can't give up any days. So, you know, I apologize to you. I know how disruptive that was to your families, uh, to people that are working. Um, and you know, kind of hang in there with us, and and hopefully this will be something that we're able to solve. Um, I also wanted to ask, uh, talk about the uh, new state mandated changes that have come to Brockton. You already touched on that, kind of core. Um, but one of the other ones were new teacher evaluations, and uh, what we were seeing in schools in other states were if the kids were doing bad on these tests. Um, teachers were being fired, and um, schools would be being labeled as family, and then they would close the school and um, <clears throat> replace the staff. We were wondering, is that something that could happen in, in Brockton? Uh, you know, th th there's nothing, I'm sorry, your name? Ross. Ross. Mm -hmm. There is nothing more important in your district than your teachers. You know, I need, you need, you know, high quality teachers to make sure that our children are learning. But this is what I'm also going to say to you. When you talk about the educator evaluation system, if you go back, I told you I've been a teacher for 37 years. I could actually bring in here tonight my evaluation on a piece of paper and a little white book. I can remember as a young 22-year-old going home to my mother, I was living with my mom and being excited about my evaluation. And, and you, you, know, you didn't feel you did well unless you got all superiors down one column. It didn't give me a lot of feedback. I was very fortunate as a young teacher that I had mentors. I had teachers that I could learn from. What happens with this new ed evaluation tool? And Brockton is piloting it this year. So in September, we brought all our administrators together, principals, uh, their leadership teams, and we brought teachers on board. And we had training with how we unveiled this system this year. My feeling about this as a superintendent is first of all, I need this to have credibility. I need the teachers to trust, like Ross said. It's not to get rid of somebody. If I have a young teacher or a teacher on board that needs supports, what I need that principal or that leadership team doing that is evaluating the teachers is to go in and look at the practice and to be having a dialogue with the teacher. How can I make them better? You know, is there professional development? Do they need to look at their class management? <laughs> I love the piece that now says, you need to talk to families. There needs to be ways for you to communicate with parents, with the community. So it is a comprehensive evaluation piece. It is not a piece to get rid of anybody. Now, in, in any career, you know, if we have teachers that after all of this support, you know, all of this opportunity to improve, are not able to remain teachers in a classroom, then you're correct that if that happens, you know, hopefully you counsel people out of a career that they should not be in for 35 years. I'm going to tell you, you know, I live in Brockton. I'm a taxpayer like every one of you. And again, it is important for me to make sure that a teacher is a million dollar investment over time. So if we're going to invest in those teachers, we need to make sure we're supporting them every way possible so they can be successful, they can teach your kids, we can make sure that scores are on the way up. We can support all of our children by making sure you have high quality staff. So I know you've come and you've talked at the school committee meetings, and I'm happy to continue this dialogue. But I assure you, as a former teacher, 
there's nobody as a superintendent that, that will not support them as much as I will. And make sure we get through this year and people feel good about this process. Once you have a trusting relationship about the process, I think you're more open to suggestions. When we're talking about one thing we're seeing in the district is many times when the kids are coming in as elementary students, we're not seeing the progress until they're getting past the middle schools, getting into the high school, where we had 95% on ELA this past year. I mean, that's tremendous. And I don't want to say even for an urban school district, dealing with the transiency rate, dealing with English language learners coming in, sometimes at 14, 15, 16 years old. So as a district, there are some things we need to look at. And, and again, come December, I'll be glad to share with you individual schools. What are the plans going forward for the superintendent to support those principals, to support the leadership teams, to make sure we're looking at some of the concerns we have. One is the area of science at an elementary level. We're just bringing that in. That is a new curriculum for children, again, in the elementary school. So to be looking at a fifth grade science score, you know, the children haven't been exposed to some of these things as much as they should have. And that's across the state. That is not just the Brockton Public Schools. The other thing you heard us talk about last night is when you see other districts doing better in certain areas, what we need to do is put together teams and look at best practices in other districts. I can't tell you the number of districts that come to Brockton to go see your Brockton High School, to come and see the literacy initiative that goes on up there, to come and see the success of our urban students that should have been a level one school. And we talked about last night that there was a glitch with the uh, student uh, graduation rate. And that had to do with our special needs population at Brockton High School. Many times we keep them longer than a four year period. And because of that rate, our Brockton High should have been a level one high school and wasn't. So a lot of this is the accountability system. If you want to look at a good presentation to understand it, I don't know if you found it helpful last night, understanding the different levels. I want to get that too. You certainly yeah. can. So again, you know, take, take a look at that. Ethan Cancel, Dr. Cancel, does an excellent job of presenting that kind of information. And as I said, I think it's more important to you that come December, when we've had a chance to get through the district review, that we'll start to share with you what our plans are going forward. For And there are, there are areas of concern. And I also want you to know, and I said it last night, nobody believes in this district as a superintendent more than I do. I believe in your principals. I believe in the teachers. I believe in our families, but I'm going to share with you honest information. You know, it isn't going to be information that is hidden from you. It's going to be information that we share. I want you to know in every one of your schools, if you don't know your school improvement plan, shame on you and shame on the principal. That should be something that when you're going to PAC meetings, when you're in the schools, I want you to see what the plan is. So, and that plan addresses the individual needs of what's happening in those schools. And the same thing with the superintendent's strategic plan going forward. I want to make sure that when, when I'm able to share this with you after we get all of this information, this will be developed within our district. These will be the marching orders where all of our resources, everything will support this strategic plan, which will talk about growing your own for diversity. You know, it'll talk about reducing class size. It'll talk about how our students are achieving. So again, this is important information for you to have. And I hope you understand that as superintendent, I want to be transparent with you about how we're doing in the district, because that's the only way we're going to get better. Well, certainly, you know, businesses have best practices. That's how they're successful. You know, I don't want to just use, you know, Bernardi as an example, but I will tell you it was interesting because as director of community schools, it's not often, and this was back in 2010, um, we had a 40th anniversary celebration. And we were celebrating the opening of Brockton High School back in 1970. At the time, it was the inaugural year of the community school program. And those of you that don't know what that is, is when we built Brockton High School back in 1970, it cost $16.3 million. Nowadays, you build a high school like that, you're talking over $100 million. But again, our forefathers had great foresight in building that high school. So in celebrating that, we had a celebration and one of the things that happened at the time was Bernardi came knocking at the door. They were new, a new business in the area. And they said, how can we support you? You know, what can we do for education to support you? So as the director of community schools, I developed a relationship. 
Uh, the vice president is, is Amy Rossi. Uh, and Amy, again, came and supported some of the fun things that we did for the 40th anniversary. They came and supported, we had a, a kickoff football game, Columbus Day weekend, where in that stadium marched every class from 1970 right up to, to 2010. Uh, we had a celebration for all of the community to come that evening. I think we had events all year long. We celebrated the drama. We celebrated our athletics. Um, we had a, a dance and invited the community, and it was all to celebrate you know, our Brockton High School and community schools. What else it does when you talk about growing a relationship with businesses, we have a driver education program in community schools. And we were told that some of the kids weren't signing up because the cars were older. And what we ended up doing was we were able to purchase a couple of cars for the program within our budget. And Bernardi came in again and said, we'll partner with you. We'll give you a new car. It's a leased car. Every three years, your children are driving around in a new Elantra. And we certainly do advertise. You know, we advertise and say courtesy of Bernardi Auto. I'd like to say to the community courtesy of, I, I'd invite any other auto businesses out there to come and support our children. That's not an unusual collaboration. Businesses can support us in many ways, and they are part of the community. Um, and they're not looking, you know, what are they looking for in return? My understanding is they want to be part of the community. They're hoping that we're educating our children so they become successful. Not everybody is going to work in education. People are going to work in the banks. They're going to work in businesses. They're going to work at, you know, certainly many of our community businesses that, that are here. So I see that as a real plus for us. Last night we had a donation from, I think it was Target. And when you heard the parent who had gone to the Brookfield School, and I think her daughter did also, and she said, I work at Target and Braintree. She said, I found that they had excess pencils and pens and all of these things, and they wanted to donate it to a school system. She said, I thought of the Brookfield School. Do you know how thrilled, I know we have a Brookfield teacher here. I see Jenna out there. And, you know, they were talking about pencils, paper. I brought up probably Kleenex. You know, things that, that again, you find teachers going out there to buy for your children. Some of you as parents probably send in a box of Kleenex. So all of that is helpful. So when we have a business that wants to support us and tell us that our families and our children are important, I think that's important. You also ask, you know, a seat at the table. In my transition team planning, I'm excited to have people from Harbor One there you know, people from the business community to talk to us about how we can be a better school system. It doesn't mean that they're designing lessons, but they're supporting us in educating our children. Up at Brockton High, you actually have a bank on campus. I don't know if you had the opportunity to either open accounts or work there as a student. So our students have an education where they're brought in while they're students at Brockton High School. I see many of them in jobs in Harbor One which is one of our largest employers in the city of Brockton. So I, I see this as a very positive thing as a superintendent, and a lot of that came from my background in uh, working in community schools. Hi, Kathy. Um, I have a student, um, which you know is special needs in a substantially separate classroom, so as I'm as part of the strategic plan going forward, um, is there any um, thoughts to maybe extending the school year for certain populations of students that really have the capability of learning, but you need to close that huge achievement. And you know what, Donna? All of the research shows that the longer time, whether it's an English language learner, a special needs student, you know, that loss in learning in the summer is huge, and all of the research points to that. And you and I have had these discussions, and, and I don't want to tell you that some of it is definitely budgetary, but that, that's not a good enough excuse. So when you're saying that to me, and, and this is information I'm sure I'm going to hear far and wide, you know, it really is incumbent upon us. You know, we have the capability. We do it better than anybody. If you look at our summers, you would never know that schools close. You go to some area towns, those high schools are closed down. They might have a couple of rec programs going on, but nothing like we have going on. One of the things I'm also going to tell you is, I'm looking at my organizational structure, and one of the things that I want to bring in are additional people to support with grants and development, because I'm convinced out there that in a community where budget makes a difference, I need to look at every penny that is out there if it supports our mission, if it supports our st strategic plan, and if it has research behind it. You know, it's important for us to be able to do that. Um, and again, you know, I, I know Brendan. Brendan's my neighbor, Donna's son. 
and I know what you put in as a parent and the amount of effort you put to make sure he has every opportunity. He's playing the piano now. You and I had a discussion about, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could have piano lessons? And there are so many things that, that I'd love to do. And, you know, Donna and I had to have talked at length. And when I talk to special needs parents out there, those of you here or those of you watching on cable, we're looking to support you in a way where you become an advocacy, advocacy group together to have materials. We're looking for a facility, a room for our bilingual parents, our special needs parents, where you can come up with these suggestions and you have the superintendent's ear all the time. It's not going to just be a one-time listening tour or a one-time strategic plan. You know, I truly want to be able to move on many of the things that you and I have had such great discussions about. I know a lot of times, uh, as a parent, you know, I, I look to my son's teacher to, to do what they're supposed to do. We look to the administration. But as a parent, what can I do more of to ensure that my son is going to get what he needs? I mean, I attend PTA meetings. He's involved in community school programs. But as a parent, the staff at home, what do I need to do to, to allow my son to thrive, to do what he needs to do, and, and not just go to my, his teachers and expect them to be the end all be all? I'm not trying to, you know, put that down, but I'm just saying, I, as a parent, as a mother, I want to make sure he's doing what he's supposed to be doing. So there are there resources, uh, you know, I know there's a library, but what else as a parent can I be doing? You know, that's a good question, Janice, and of course, you know, I know you, and I know you as a parent, and I know that your focus, as so many of you, when I look out at you tonight, I know that your focus is all about your child, making sure they're going to school, making sure they're doing their homework, making sure they're a good friend, making sure they're not bullying, making sure that, that they're respectful of our diverse population in this city. So I know you're all doing those wonderful things. So I'm not here to tell you that you know there are opportunities for you to to read to be out there like you said the libraries the museums taking advantage of all of those things that all of us you know try to do within our budget as families um, I think what we need to do better is to it, it, it's it's really upsetting to me when I think of I'll, I'll listen to some of the uh, let, let me take PACS for instance it isn't all about just fundraising Okay, good. It isn't all about fundraising. So when we talked about the Edibal tool, and I said to you the thing that I liked the best was that there is a piece there that says the teacher needs to communicate with the parent and the community. And when you've heard me, if you heard me talk in my interview, one of the things I talked about were teacher leaders. So what I mean by that is the principal and assistant can't do it alone. But I would like to see in every one of your schools across the district, and this is something, again, that I would bargain with the teachers, that I support teachers in the schools to be looking in the area of policies and procedures in the school, to making sure that our procedures that run the schools are developed also within the schools. I'd like the teachers to be supporting things that are happening out in the community. So I would like a teacher to work with the principal to make sure that we're providing events for parents. And it isn't just about fundraising. Fundraising is great. And we wouldn't be able to take field trips, and we wouldn't be able to do some of the special things that you as parents work so hard to provide for our students. But also, do we want to bring cultural events into the schools? I want you to have the say as far as what you want to see happen at the Kennedy School. What do you want at the Davis? And we have a super PAC meeting, and I'm trying to come up with another title for that. I'd love it to be like the superintendent coffee hour, where it's something where we sit down and we have dialogue. And you're, again, talking to me about things that you would like to see happening in the school that enrich your children's lives. Uh, my question is, is the teacher evaluation uh, going to be um, uh, manifested, I guess I'll say, in the same way as the MCAS results? Because the MCAS results seem to be a complex equation that was somewhat inconclusive. Um, and if that's the case, um, is there, at some point, are we going to be the community, parents as well, I'm going to be able to redesign that framework on some level. I'm sorry, your first name? Charles. Charles. Uh, again, when we talk about the Edaval tool, some of the things that I think Charles is speaking to are what are called, we call them DDMs, another one of those things in teaching that everyone's around there saying to me, you know, what does that mean? So in the teacher evaluation piece, there is something called district determined measures. 
which shows the community if the teacher is actually raising the bar for those students. Are they showing achievement for students in the classroom? As far as how that is shared, none of that has been determined yet. It is still in the infant stages. And when you heard me talk about piloting, so the state right now has two years worth of teacher evaluations where there are some districts in the state that are already in their second year of doing the ed eval tool. You heard me say in Brockton, we are in our first year. There are other districts across the state that will have their first year next year. So many of these things aren't determined yet as far as what kind of impact that has on, you're talking about the community being able to look at so-called scores. Uh, yeah, the only reason I had a concern was because just like the NCAS result, it seemed to be like a series of data, and the, the data is kind of, like I said, a complex equation, it's hard to I'm figure out. So I was wondering if you knew, and I guess you don't, if it's going to be coming in the same format. I don't, believe it, I don't believe it'll be as complex, but they have not determined how they share with you the results of this one portion of a teacher's evaluation. If there is a, a teacher that is not showing growth with their students, it does determine what kind of a plan they go on. You know, a, 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 like an, an improvement plan, so to say. So I'm not sure how much that'll be public knowledge, how much will be shared with the public, but that is something that is part of the EdAval tool and the EdAval plan. Yep. Use the microphone, Chase. The other woman said that she said the Common Core didn't seem to be showing any actual results, so anything that she could see. So is there going to be a plan for, to redesign those results if they prove to still be not valid? You know, I'm not worried about the Common Core. I can't blame our district for having some areas of concern that it is related to the Common Core. You know, the Common Core is just coming in. We're starting to make changes, <clears throat> writing across the curriculum, looking at it's, it's transitioning in. It is not completely in, in any one area. So I can't blame some of the results on the Common Core. What I will tell you is exactly what I told you. Every school will be looked at. Those results will be shared and our intervention, interventions or our plans going forward will be shared openly with you. I have a question. Um, my question is basically going to follow up on this. Um, when it comes to, uh, let's say we realized early on, like Maine did recently, that Common Core was bad to get into, would you sign up with most superintendents across the country, Utah, California, Texas, et cetera, and start to get us out of Common Core? I don't think I can answer for you right now whether I will take Brockton out of Common Core. Mm -hmm. What I will tell you mm -hmm. is I work, again, in collaboration with you know, not only certainly our district, our district leaders, but I'm in touch with superintendents all over the state of Massachusetts. And we will make sure that our children are protected as far as their learning. There is nothing more important to a superintendent, and especially this superintendent. You know, as I said, these are our children, these are my neighbors, you know, these are our friends. So we will make sure as a community that our children are succeeding, that they're getting accepted to colleges, that they're successful in their careers going forward. And as far as the Common Core, what I will stand here and tell you is I was at a graduation last June. You had 900 Brockton students cross that field. Not everybody was successful at Brockton High. You have four or five alternative programs to make sure that your children have opportunities. We have been very successful. You have the most Adams scholars throughout the state. So I'm not ready to panic about the Common Core. I will certainly continue to educate myself and to educate you going forward. Uh, this is not something Brockton is in alone, but we have been very successful as a district with our students. And hopefully we will continue in that way. You know, one of the, when you talk about, I told you one of my roles was a school adjustment counselor in the district. Uh, it was a role, and this was a number of years ago. The caseloads for your school adjustment counselors are difficult. You're talking up at the high school with 4,000 students. We probably have six school adjustment counselors, and we could probably use six more, and it still wouldn't be enough to deal with some of the issues that we know children go home to. One of the things the district has um, taken under its wing in a number of schools is we have trauma-sensitive schools where we're talking to our teachers. You know, when a child comes to school 
and their head is on the desk or they're not willing to participate in the lesson. You know, it's incumbent upon the teacher. We don't know what happened the night before. We actually have initiatives in place where the Brockton police will contact the Brockton Public Schools to let our director of guidance know about a domestic violence situation that happened in a home the night before. So when we're bringing these children into the school, you know, we can support those students to make sure that they're getting all the assistance that they need. It's certainly not enough. One of the things we've resorted to, and resorted to a lot of years ago, again, because of budgetary concerns, we resorted to bringing in the South Bay Mental Health, the BAMSI, the other agencies that can support students with individual counseling. It's a model that helps us. I feel much better when I know that it's a school adjustment counselor who is part of an educational planning team who can support additional help. We have our Huntington School, and I think many of you know that it's a school that has extended learning time in the afternoon. It also has an extra hour of school in the morning for the students. And the principal is constantly talking to me about wraparound services. It's a school where we've devoted some funds in the evening. So the parents, it's a lot of English language learners at the Huntington School. And the parents in the evening and during the day have an opportunity to take English language classes to support their language development to assist their students. We've talked about bringing in dental care to do screenings to make sure that if children can, you know, if, if they're not learning, some of it could be attributed to not getting the proper dental care. I'd love to see mental health services brought in for those wraparound services for those schools that are willing to, again, reach out and support that kind of assistance for their families. Not any one answer is a good enough answer because society today, it, it is very difficult to support some of these children and families in the ways that they're needed. But it is something that I am very sensitive to and, and would like to support, you know, certainly more than we're doing. For, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Anthony Donegan and I'm your Ward 3 school committee person. Um, I also happen to be lucky enough to sit on a board at the high school, uh, the, the accreditation committee. And that very issue has come up. Uh, on the high school level as well too so it's not something that I would think has even filtered its way to the superintendent's office yet but it is something that they're very very much aware of and very much concerned about and I can tell you as a as an attorney that deals with a lot of juvenile court issues and a parent um, I know and I think that this I can speak for the school system they, they're very well aware of what trauma can uh, can how, how that can affect the kids learning um, we need. We know we need more resource officers in the schools, um, or, or we should say adjustment councils, not resource officers. Excuse me, I misspoke. But uh, that would go a long way. One of the other things that they're looking at too, and of course this would have to be done in the context of union negotiations and all this other stuff, is can we designate a homeroom teacher, for example, or a teacher who every pretty much every kid hopefully goes through school and establishes a bond or a relationship with at least one teacher. Um, and if that teacher could be that go-to person for certain students, so that if there was, was a traumatic incident that was affecting his or her learning, that they need to have that trusted, competent adult that's nearby that they can talk to and say, hey, this is what happened, something happened. Personally and, and professionally, I'd rather have them doing that than have police and DCF and all social workers and members of the government agencies involved, but that I, I think that sometimes you can resolve problems a lot cl cleaner and more easily uh, if you can do it quietly um, and not with government intervention, but certainly there are situations that require that kind of intervention, and it's not something that I think that the school system is unaware of, and it's, it's obviously has a profound effect on the kid's ability to learn, and it's something that I think we really have to look at in order to help close that achievement gap. So thank you for bringing it up. I want to thank all of you for coming. And one thing that's evident with me, I've seen a number of you at the hearing of visitors. You have uh, concerns, and, and I think that's important to us as a community to hear those concerns. Unfortunately, many times you don't get to have dialogue during the hearing of visitors at the school committee. As I do this listening tour, I think it's becoming evident to me that maybe what the superintendent needs to do on a regular basis is come to the four corners of the city and to have parents come in and share their concerns. So again, as part of our transitional plan, 
maybe this is something that we can do on a more regular basis than not, and not just for preparing for a new superintendent coming on board. So I'm happy to do that if it's something that makes a difference for, for all of you. So again, thank you very much, and uh, I'm sure I'll be seeing many of you along the way.